Good morning, everyone. Thank you to everyone that has been able to join us. I'm Chris Fletcher, so I'm head of sales within NASTAR, and we're a managed service organisation we specialise in networking and security and cloud. But I've got a specific responsibility for public sector within the organisation. And this morning, I'm joined by Chris Parker from Fortinet. Uh, morning, Chris. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Parker. I'm the director for government strategy at Fortinet, um, and we specialise in cybersecurity. We're now, as of last year, the largest vendor on earth, and that comes with its own responsibilities, of course, things we don't take lightly. Uh, but I've got a background of quite a few different sectors, but mostly always working in high pressure, high risk leadership roles. Um, don't really know why I enjoy it so much, that sort of thing. Some people don't, but I I enjoy managing risk and making sure you can plan for it. So I'm looking forward to this morning very much. Thank you, Chris. And uh, again, thank you for your time. Um, so this morning, uh, we're going to look at digital transformation across the public sector, and we're going to have a focus on SD1 and the adoption of SD technologies. Uh, and the reason that we've invited Fortinet to be involved with that is because they're a key strategic partner of, of ourselves and they support ourselves with our customers when we're looking to deploy SD technology. And it forms a massive part of our investment as a managed service partner. So we've got a number of questions ahead of this webinar, and hopefully we can address those at the end as part of the Q&A. But if there are any more throughout this, then please drop them into the comments box. and We'll be happy to address these at the end of the sessions, or we might even uh, be able to address them as we, uh, as we answer a couple of questions. So if we start things off, Chris, and maybe to, to frame the world of, uh, of digital transformation, it'd be good to get your view about how you're seeing um, digital transformation in public sector and the adoption of new technologies. Yeah, I think it's particularly unique, and I'm sure most of the people listening this morning will, will know that in the public sector with the big subject of digital transformation. I think it's something that's always easy to say, especially on a strategy or on a a leadership document, but very, very difficult to actually enact, and especially so in the public sector. And I think that's one thing that we really have to salute and take our hat off uh, in the private sector to all the people who are involved in the public sector with digital security or data provision, because the ability to operate with what is often, as we know, a very complicated, often multiple layered, bolted together at various people over the years systems, which also contain a lot of legacy technology. So I think we're seeing at Fortinet, especially the reality where rubber hits the road, that there's too many gaps. And I think it was it was back in the 2016 National Cybersecurity Strategy, which is still extant, still live, because it's been subsumed by the National um, Cyber Strategy. But the cybersecurity piece, um, interesting, I think it's something like page 13. Um, there's a bit in there which says about this very point, and it says that, We've often seen in the public sector and other sectors a balance between convenience and security, and sometimes it's gone too far to convenience. And a lot of us will recognise that where it's just not been practical to function. And that's one of the biggest challenges of digital transformation in the public sector, because you still have to operate. You're not just doing an all terminal where you've got a few ships coming through every day and that's your target audience. You're talking perhaps tens of thousands of people will visit your websites, your offices, interact with your staff um, and it's a hugely dynamic and moving and, and needling, needing to be transparent digital transformation. Very, very difficult. So again, I think we take our hats off to all the people involved in it. But the great thing is, hence this morning and a lot of our organisations, there's lots of help out there. Absolutely. And, and you touch upon the element of security and, and managing risk. So what, what particular elements are you seeing around security and, and managing risk? And it'd be good to get a bit of insight about where you've seen some really good examples of that as well, Chris. Absolutely. I think when you when you think about it, it doesn't take to be a rocket scientist to work out that if you bolt together lots of different systems and you have that system we just talked about where it's multiple layers, perhaps different eras. And I mean, health service is a great example, of course, of very outdated technology in a lot of places. But what can they do about it? Because you're talking millions and also their operations are running every day. So they can't just unplug everything and have a few weeks off, which a business can do in various summer leave yeah. periods, whatever. It's very difficult. So I think the integration of security, the key bit we always say is to whatever you're doing to make sure you design in security from the outset. And the great news is, this is really good news, is that 
it's actually getting easier to do that because the the great security systems that are out there are starting to effectively form part of the networking solution. And so that's really, and we'll look at that with some of our chat on SD-WAN and specifically how Fortinet do it. Because if you get that security built in from the outset, you don't have to have those gaps, which the national strategy was worried about and that we all know are there. And also there's a key part here about security is security is all about being ready for a threat coming in. We know the threats are very big. And I was always taught and learned the hard way many times that readiness, to have true readiness, and um, some people would say that's part of resilience, but just let's just call it res readiness, is a function of capability and training. So the capability is technology and nice things, systems we bought. But you've got to have the human factor, the training. How are we going to operate this and what protocols and procedures are we using to make sure people don't mess around with it and do these crazy things? So I think from some of the aspects we've seen in Fortinet, the ability to make sure you match the people um, with the technology is very important. And that's one really important thing is to make it simple. Too many times I see systems that are so complicated, you need an awful lot of training and it's very easy to miss something or make a mistake. So we always advocate what we call in Fortinet the single pane of glass approach, which is one of the advantages and successes of our process systems is that you can see everything very easy. It's very easy to operate for the operators. And that of course reduces some of the human error risk straight away. And we mentioned about from my experience and things before, I'm always a big fan of risk registers. And a lot of people say, ah, boring. Well, a risk register often is the thing that gets brought out after an incident. And everyone sort of hits themselves around the head with a with risk register and says, well, how did I miss that? Um, but the reality is it's a living document. And I always advocate to people who are looking at digital transformation, you know, if you haven't got one, create one. If you have got one, bring it up to date. And what you should definitely do is every month renew it and refresh it, because then you'll start being able to drive your your real needs on a day-to-day -day basis from real risks and match overmatch those risks with good solutions. And in terms of you mentioned examples, Chris, I think this morning we can certainly say that I've seen several times, and we don't obviously name clients as a protocol, but we, we do an awful lot of uh, support and, and work to secure people's data and devices in the UK. But I've seen one particular example where it was really a lack, again, human factor, very good systems in place, but they just lack of supervision allowed a, a junior member to try and set something up due to the lockdown. It was easier for them, but it wasn't certainly easier for the organization. It led to a gap. And when that particular person got um, uh, attacked and his, his computer got hacked, uh, home working, it really unlocked the whole organization, which was pretty tragic. Um, worse than that, when they then found out and did their investigation, they found that a lot of the things they should have put in were not in place. Now, I think that teaches a really good lesson as well is that it's constant checking. You just got to keep checking, keep looking, perhaps looking at the risks and what if this happened today and what if that happened tomorrow? And therefore, it, it's quite a high stress environment, as we know, IT management, but there's that setting up the systems, but then there's that operational routine to get into that. And the best organizations that I see are the ones that do have that regular review and they set it up as the as they have being hard on themselves and particularly looking at how their systems and technology are they good enough and being really honest with themselves as organizations. Thank you. I, I think you touched upon a point there about, you know, an example within the recent uh, sort of lockdown period of the last 18 and 19 months. And I think it's it's fair to say that tested some of the theories and the good practice that you've talked about. And clearly we've seen the, the public sector organisations work in a in a more agile organisation and uh, more agile way, making decisions quicker and being forced into things that they normally wouldn't have adopted. Very similar to what private sector might do in, in the norm. Um, you touched on a bit there about SD1 and SD technology. It'd be good to get a view on where you see that within the, the transformation journey for public sector organisations. Absolutely. I think a lot of people listening to this today will be intrigued by SD1. They'll be aware of SD1. But when you really look at the, you step back a bit, as I always say to people, look at the, what you're trying to achieve and what's the end state, what are you trying to do in your digital transformation, where are you going to? You cannot get a better building block, I think, than SD-WAN as a foundation structure, especially if you use an SD-WAN, which I would say this, but the FortiGate based, our, our FortiGate firewall world leading has the SD-WAN built in. So inherently it's symbiotic. You've got the security and the SD-WAN working together. It also has a self-healing function. There's some great new technology in the latest operating system with Fortinet. But I think the big thing about SD-WAN is it does give that agility to have that building block. And we must remember 
public sector is probably prone to it more than even the enterprise sector is that someone will come up with a bright idea or a change or we're going to have home working because an external factor like covid comes in and the ability to be agile and scalable and you can go from sd wan solutions to sd branch solutions and have smaller fragmented but highly secure systems but the one beauty of the sd wan approach is that you do have that end-to-end -end security and that contiguous constant reassurance of the same security system running throughout the whole organization no gaps remember that thing we said about the uh, the national policy wants to avoid that and it does allow the bolt-in of all those other products and i think the questions that people should ask themselves in the organizations that are listening is that if you do have sd wan what's the technology level of it is it is it strong enough is it enterprise grade or is it just good enough we'll we'll cope with it um, and if they're not sure about that, they should be asking experts. They should be calling in their, their advisors, people like yourselves, ourselves, and saying, "What have I got this right? And often we find even that isn't done enough. I, I've never met a company in the space that refuses to help somebody. I mean, it's just part of our life, our part of our job, because with the help becomes the work. That's what we do. So I think to sum up on that, the SD WAN Park, great building block, um, highly agile, scalable, and when we think what's coming soon, the sort of 5G, 100 times faster than 4G, Internet of Things, that will largely run a lot of it on the 4G system. So a lot of sensors, a lot of systems, the ability to have that increased data capacity, um, that's a huge advantage to get those building blocks to have your, your whole organization built with security from the outset as a main theme throughout. Thank you. And, and SD1 adoption has, has probably accelerated over the last 12 to 18 months for, for some of the things that you that you talk around. Is there anything specific that you've seen maybe from the health or local government sector that's really making people consider SD1 more seriously than maybe three or four years ago, where it was something that people really weren't sure about what it meant to them as an organisation? It's a really good point. Someone said the other day that the whole fact that we've had the COVID thing is in a way been in some ways a benefit. It's sort of transformed digitally because we've had to uh, and the home working. So we've got sort of two levels there where people are going to work. But then you've also got perhaps the key targets, people who might be dealing with highly sensitive work or decisions in local government. You mentioned there, Chris, but certainly in central government, as we know, anything that leaks out is potentially embarrassing or indeed damaging to the country. So from our point of view, let's just say that um, take one example of a, of a major government department that we we assist with the security there and we secure them. Uh, they were able to send all their staff home, which is in the tens of thousands in just one week because the system was set up to be agile enough that they could yep. then plug in and, and adjust that way. And also senior people can effectively, by they're having a forty gate at their home, and I have one at my home, is that that allows people to have the SD-WAN plug-in because the 48 is there at their home, so they can run their own system there. Indeed, they can run, when we got to that sort of hybrid working, meetings at their home, and I'm sure a lot of us have done that, where we realise that people can meet up and chat. Um, there's that whole scalability, that flexibility of the SD-WAN piece. I think in terms of the, the people who've been glad that they've had SD-WAN with the lockdown, that's undoubted. I think they've, they've known how good it is. I think what's interesting is it's the people who decided not to or perhaps had multiple systems, they've had a real problem because the, the, the system, once it starts coming under some pressure and tension, those gaps do become more highlighted. And if they're highlighted to us, you can bet your bottom dollar, they'll be easy to spot from an attacker because they're easier to get in at when there's systems under pressure from uh, external factors such as COVID or forcing remote working and other things. So I think, I think yeah, this has been part of the success story. And I think it'll be something that evolves and builds in the in the coming rest of this decade for sure. And I think the example you use there really resonates with us. I, I'm assuming it's a very similar customer to us and, and indeed that driver to, to work from home. Uh, and I think the comment we had from the CIO, that, that's something that would have taken 18 months under normal circumstances, you know, with managing the risk and understanding what would happen. So uh, again, a great example of how the, the network enabled that. And um, you touched upon a point there around the world of, of hybrid working. So as we're coming out of the world of COVID or we're, we're learning to, to live with it, if you like, and, and hybrid working seems to be that, that key agenda item across all sectors, not just public sector. And um, what, what are you seeing in the world of, of hybrid working um, in public sector? And, yeah. and, and how is that networking element really underpinning and driving that? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I think a lot of us would expect it to be a big uh, discussion point, and it is. I think one of the biggest factors is rising zero trust. People want to talk about zero trust a lot and understand it and work out. A lot of people don't even like the name zero trust, and I get that. It doesn't sound very nice that you don't trust anybody, especially your own employees. Um, but the reality is it's it's actually individual, because if, if someone takes from my identity or does something, then I actually don't want the embarrassment of myself being the person who unleashes hell on my organization. I would want that zero trust to, to get in there and that system multi-factor authentication and those sort of good systems to stop that. But in terms of the ability for with hybrid working for the technology to help, let's look at it this way. that The fact that the hybrid working thing has happened has not gone unnoticed by the hackers. And of course, we've seen this enormous rise in ransomware um, in you know, effectively doubling in ransomware in the last year. And that's largely because people have become a lot less um, security aware. They're sat at home, they're perhaps a little bit more relaxed about things. The ability for people to remind and refresh verbally and physically and get into work mode perhaps has not been there. And they've exploited gaps. So with the ability for us to think about hybrid working as sometimes a positive digitally, it's also been a negative because the stats bring that out. And that says again that what people have got to look for is a system that is agile and constantly updating and we're very lucky in Fortinet we have the Fortinet security fabric which I'm sure most people know automatically updates with anything globally that's interacting on any of our systems which is over half a million users worldwide now that instantaneously will lock in again that information and I think it's currently uh, 60 million URLs blocked and rising so there's uh, that means that I benefit as a user of someone who's getting attacked right now in Japan or South Africa. So there's an enormous sort of global community happening there as well. And when you rely that to the, the fact that the FortiGates are update, updated, but they have the SD-WAN built in, that means, of course, there is no risk of any gaps appearing on that system because it's all inherently uh, operating together as integrated security. And, and it's quite interesting, the world of, of hybrid working in, in public sector, because it's not something that's really been, been adopted in quite quite the contrary in fact with the world of presenteeism whereas if you you think across the, the fence in the enterprise organizations then it's something that's been been ad adopted you know quite quite freely if you like so I suppose if we take it outside of the the technology from a world of hybrid working what, what challenges are you seeing in public sector outside of the, te the technology to actually be able to work in that hybrid way yeah, we, spoke, we touched on it earlier, Chris, didn't we? We said about the fact that, that that readiness is a function of capability and training. And how can we keep people up to, to speed? Is still that culture change is needed, there's no doubt about it. But also, I think some of the best ways I've seen some of the best practices where people actually say, we actually care about you and we want to protect you and your family. So we're going to train you up and you're going to do some training. So it's very much taken on board by the individual that this is securing me, my own bank account, my home, my family, my kids. And that's a very positive way of making sure that everyone becomes more security aware. Um, I think most of the vendors, and us included, provide training, free training. Um, what's surprising is that that's not taken up as much as traps. I think it ought to be and refreshed regularly. Um, I also would say that there's some brilliant stuff done by the National Cyber Security Centre. They do um, everything from basic training online for free. Obviously, we have the Cyber Essentials Scheme, which they back and underpin, but also there's the things like the exercise in a box. So to allow not just the individuals, but perhaps a collective team to try these exercises, which are all online, free through NCSC, um, to work out their robustness as an organisation. So we can, we can crack it with the technology, but we can also work harder, I think, now to make sure we can get that people part right. And that's where I think expert organisations, and you'll know this better than me, uh, can advise when on that people factor and, and increase that that uh, readiness and that capability for people by the human factors, definitely. Yeah, thank you. And um, we're going to do a couple of questions, Chris, then we've got some other questions coming through from uh, from people that have, have joined us. So, you know, we, we talked about the, 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 the transformation in public sector, the adoption of SD1, and, and it's fair to say that, as we've discussed, it has accelerated and people are finding more of a driver for it. So I suppose we're, you know, not at the norm of SD1, but from a from a, a Fortinet perspective, what, what do you see the future of networking? So what what's what's next? What's coming down the line? And uh, you know, what will what will you be talking about as we embrace for the next 12 to 18 months? 
No, that's a good point. Isn't it? What's coming over the over the horizon, really? And I think we've seen an increase in speed requirement, and obviously the on onset of five G has driven that. So we've done that with our our fastest firewall was announced in the middle of the year, just as just ending now. Um, I think we've also had um, a big increase in people realizing the scalability and the flexibility and data capacity with this internet of things and the fact that everyone wants to digitize their councils their health services and other things it's an enormous amount of increased data capacity and in fact increased secure data capacity in some of the more specialist public sector services such as ministry of defense and others they need that large scale maybe video content well secured and the good news is that We've certainly seen that you know, people like the Ministry of Defence and others are moving fast to see the advantages of, again, SD-WAN based um, philosophy where you can try and make sure that large data capacity. So there we'll see an increase in data capacity. I think there'll be an increased need for agility because the whole home working piece will mean that perhaps large offices, as we all probably know, are going to be a thing of the past. And there may well be more shared offices, shared workspaces, and perhaps an opportunity to work somewhere closer to home. And plug in. I can see that in the public sector. That seems yeah. a natural evolution. Um, so, so that we've seen that coming as well. And of course, the advantages of SD WAN again. Therefore, you can make that through to SD branch, where you can have these sort of smaller uh, branch organisations, branch networks. Again, totally secure endpoint to endpoint. And I think the only other thing I just men mentioned is that the the capacity rising, but the ability also for the speed. I think that's the one thing. It's speed and capacity. Everyone will be expecting things to be super fast. Um, a lot of us remember the old fashioned days of buffering and that will not be tolerated when everyone's phone is on 5G and instantaneous. So we do have to ensure that the whole system, everyone's network is fast enough. And like any security, the very worst thing you can do is slow everything down because that just means worst case people turn it off. So I think that's where the next five years will be coming, increase in speed, increase in capacity, and that will help that scalability piece. And don't forget what I said about SD branch and this hybrid of working, perhaps more remote sites in the public sector where uh, that'll help the employment challenges of the public sector as well, I think, also. Yeah, and I echo the element on speed. I think, you know, the, the amount of bandwidth that's been consumed over the last 18 months from, from home of various non, non office spaces has, has really demonstrated that. And, uh, you know, from a, a point of view about, you know, talent in the public sector, it's fair to say that public sector organisations have always drawn from local, local talent pools. You know, speaking with a, an NHS organisation in the Midlands the other week, they're using the world of hybrid to attract talent from from around the country. So being able to compete with large organisations that offer flexible working, agile working arrangements, and that's a, you know allowing them to extend their ability to offer employment to other people rather than just a small closed pool, which they're competing with enterprise organisations and indeed other colleagues in public sector as well. So you know hopefully that will provide benefit as we move forward. Um, and, and then, you know, I think the theme that, that I'm sensing from this is that, you know, out of all the benefits from an SD1 perspective, but particularly from a Fortinet, is that security layer, that inbuilt security element, uh, and it being a, a layered approach, and it's not something else that you that you have to get as part of it. Um, so I think we've got a couple of questions that have come through. Quick. So if we can just pose these, and again, if anyone else has got any questions, if you want to pop them in the in the message box, then if we've got time at the end, then we will cover them or we will come back to you as well. Um, and I think you've partly answered this one, Chris, but it might be something specific you want to to to, to focus on. So it, it comes from from Tim Green. So thanks for your question, Tim. So it talks about how does security operate within the SD1? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. We have touched on it a bit, but um, thanks, Tim, for the question. I think what the fact is, uniquely that we have that um, reassurance as Fortinet that because our FortiGate, uh, market leading Gardner, Gartner independently verified Magic Quadrant SD-WAN um, comes through the FortiGate and therefore the FortiGate effectively is switched on. Um, that means that the security is completely inherent. Um, what's really important also is that it's not a bolt-on but nor is other or nor are other products as well which can be placed in that system. So if you use a system that uh, is ideal, then it should be integrated. So the devices should talk to each other and everything should be absolutely in the equivalent of radio contact in a, a human security guards would want to be. That's happening all the time. It's talking to each other. And only through that integration 
can you get the true automation only through integration will automation come about and i think that's the one thing to make sure you can have that automatic level of security faster than the human 24 hours a day won't go sick it, it might go wrong sometimes there's bugs and things happen in our industry we know that but the ability for also to self-heal which our system does especially but other systems are now getting that that um, ai type processing that machine learning uh, function as well so i think to reassure from the question there the security is inbuilt and inherent but the beauty of it is it, it can bolt on other products with no gap because it's going to immediately integrate and therefore talk to each other securely and from that provides that true automated security thank you chris and we've got a sort of similar question to that but maybe just needs a little bit of additional so it's coming from howard and he, he talks about so how would traditional security products interoperate with a and manage sd1 and and it sort of picks up on the point that you you talked about from the start of this session where you know we've got organizations that have bought disparate technologies and for different reasons so i suppose for for an organization where they have a a, a mixed estate of security how would that interoperate with the the, the fortinet one yeah absolutely now we from the outset and for companies being going like the industry for, for 20, 25 years and for us, 20 year old company, a bit more, um, we've always had to grow up in an environment where you've got to talk to everyone's devices. So our system is fully adaptable to do that, but also so it should be because what we don't want is that we, we don't want to disrespect the fact that there's lots of products out there, a lot of systems to talk to. So the key bit is that interoperating with those traditional legacy type technologies um, you can operate and exist definitely you can plug in and, and adapt but of course if you want that true integration then when the refreshes come round, that's when people should be over the course of a few years when those particular refreshes of those products become outdated or the budget becomes available for an uplift then to get that integration should be looked at very strongly and i think that's not to say which often people do say to me you can't put all your eggs in one basket and we often hear that as a very laudable philosophy in life but the reality is we mustn't forget that when your your eggs in that basket are all the same and talking to each other integrated and those particular devices are also being served by the global network of the FortiGuard labs, the intelligence feed I mentioned about, that's a very strong positive. Um, there's also a sort of attitude that with the transformation from the legacy technologies, which public sector has got to do, um, I think that the ability to do integrate with those systems with a managed SD-WAN package as well allows people who are expert to make sure that they can recommend at the right time. It could be in the budget cycle or the technology upgrade cycle to make sure that they, it's time now to change that system for something more up to date. I think the managed part of it is really important and I'm a great believer myself having been a total failure at things like DIY in my life. I make <laughs> sure I, I outsource to an expert. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's one thing I sometimes do ask myself when I'm, I've seen post incident, you think, why, oh, why, oh, why did they do that in house? I respect it. I think it's admirable. Um, but back to risk management, why hold all that risk yourself when you've got someone who can do it a lot better for you? And normally, in terms of total cost of ownership or total whole life cost, normally better value as well. I think many people resonate with the world of outsourcing DIY and, and also out, outsourcing the world of, of paying as, as well. And indeed, we're, we're definitely seeing that. So, look, I think we've got time for maybe just one more question. So uh, this comes from Jane Coles and she wants to understand about how does the network performance reporting work? So I'll, I'll quite happily take that one. And thanks. Anne. So as a as a managed service, partner and provider of SD technologies, we've, we've seen a real shift in that management element. And if I think about some of the early deployments and our early sort of adopters of SD1, it was very much felt due to the, the nature of the, of the technology that it would be something that would, would take care of itself. Um, and it's something that they didn't need any additional reporting or any different management, but you know, over the, the course of particularly the last sort of six to 12 months, we've, we've seen a world that people are wanting something that's more akin to a, a co-managed 
And what that means is that there's that dashboard or that single pane, as you call it, Chris, where people can access network trends, utilization, but they want the comfort of that managed service partner. Again, someone that they can offload the risk to when they want to look at more complicated actions and more complicated activities. So I suppose what, what it's allowed, Jane, is that flexibility. So the ability as an organization for you to be able to, to view data, view trends, but also the ability to pass on the risk to a managed service partner who can then look at utilization and then can build building future proof based upon those uh, those customer needs. Um, so I think we're almost uh, up, up for time now, Chris. Um, so again, thank you for, for joining us this morning and spending some, some time. Uh, thank you for everyone Thanks. that sent in uh, sent in questions. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get through them all, and I can see that we've got a couple more. But if people have got any further questions, then please feel free to, to send them through, and Chris and myself will will provide a, a, a response on on those. Um, and indeed, we will the ones that we've got. So again, Chris, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chris. And thank you everyone for for listening to this. All right, thank you. Bye now.